You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week before we get to this week's story about an Army sergeant who dealt with boats. Yes, the Army has boats. More on that coming up here in just a few. But a couple of quick reminders about all of our social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Follow us at Hazard Ground at Hazard Ground Podcast. As well, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And don't forget about our promotion with Amazon. You go to our website, hazardground.com. You can click on the Amazon button at the bottom of the homepage. Or under the Sponsors tab, you can do all of your normal Amazon shopping, and we'll get a percentage of what you spend, and that percentage will be donated back to some of the great charities we've heard featured here on the Hazard Ground. Also works on your smartphone, by the way. Just go to hazardground.com on your smartphone, and when you hit the Amazon button, it will redirect you to the app, the Amazon app. So all your information is saved, and it's really easy and convenient. So continue to go to hazardground.com before you do your Amazon shopping. As well, continue to hit the Apple Podcast. Please go to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. doesn't have to be a long one. We've been getting some great ones, worldwide ones. People have been listening all over the world to the Hazard Ground. So we love seeing them. We love reading them. And we certainly appreciate all the positive feedback you guys have given us. And please help us crack the top 100 Apple Podcasts. Leave a review. And again, if you're on your phone right now listening to this, you can just click right on the Hazard Ground Podcast. Scroll down to the bottom. There's a rating and a review button right there. Hit it, and it'll take you right to where you need to go. Finally, before we get to this week's episode, uh, a lot in the news and a military social media this week based off of the comments made by Tucker Carlson of Fox News about the women in the military and about the feminism in the military. And we've seen a lot of pushback from both active duty members and pundits and sort of even, you know, former military members, everybody chiming in on this. I'm not here to get political or to tell you what you should believe or who should have said what and how people should react. But I will add that the discourse and the discussion is super important. And everybody who is involved in that discussion now will help shape the future of the military and how we act and how we react to things that come beyond this. So all I will say is caution you. Just remember that words have power, words have meaning, and how you choose them and how you represent yourself and how you go about expressing yourself in times like these is super important because we all want the very best for our military going forward. And we all take a part in that, whether you're a former service member or a current service member, you know, you have a role in what that looks like. So again, sometimes how you say something is as important as what you are actually saying. And just remember that we're all part of this and we're all in it together. Now, with all that out of the way, let's get on to this week's episode. Joining us this week on the Hazard Ground is an Army sergeant who spent six years in the Army Reserves. He is a bridge crew member. For those who do not know, the Army actually has boats, and they help bridge waterways, so it's an interesting story. He's got one deployment to Iraq that also had him end up in Syria, and he was a guest suggestion from a previous guest on the Hazard Ground who's here to share his story. He is Dale Ryder joining us on the Hazard Ground. Dale, welcome, bud. Good to talk to you. How you doing, man? Hey, I'm good. How are you doing, man? Uh, We are well. Okay, I'm excited always because I love guest suggestions, right? And this one came from Mike Medansky, a former uh, guest here on the Hazard Ground, and he was he was a great episode. Uh, But also, I'm excited because, as I mentioned, you have an interesting job in the Army, and a lot of people don't know that the Army has boats, and they have Mm -hmm. boat companies, and they actually are able to span small waterways with these you know foldable, collapsible bridges that they put out there to have vehicles roll right across them. So. I, in my first active duty assignment at Fort Hood, was assigned to an engineer battalion, the 62nd Engineer Battalion, which actually had one of the two boat companies in the active duty in all of the Army. So I am familiar with your background as a bridge crew member. I, I, this is kind of exciting for me. Yeah, that's not often. Uh, not a lot of people have heard of bridge crew members. I say 12 Charlie, and they're like, what the hell's that? And so, yeah, that's not, not too common to come across people that have heard of us. Yeah, I mean, as a maintenance guy, all I ever did was fix seals on boats. That's all we ever did because that's oh, every yeah. time they were broken, it was a seal that that rotted or cracked away and everything else. And these are, they, I mean, these boats. For those of you who haven't seen, if you Google pictures, these things are like they look like pretty high speed, you know, speed boats, right? Like, I mean, it's it's a. And if you've ever, if you haven't ever seen how the army builds bridges, it's pretty impressive, man. It really is. It's good stuff. So uh, excited to hear about it. But let's start back at the beginning. How and why did you get in the army? Um, so, uh, I've been listening to your show a lot 
and it seems like there's always like a, one of like five where it's like, you know, uh, family was doing it. So I felt like I needed to call the service country, like fight for my country, all that. And I feel like I kind of like checked off all of those, like had a family members that did all sorts of different community stuff, police officer, firefighter, uh, grandpa was in Vietnam. And so it was like, it kind of fit that. Then there was also a part of the whole, had no idea what I was going to do. I knew I needed to somehow pay for college because that wasn't going to happen without any sort of outside assistance. So it's kind of like a bunch of the reasons, I guess. Uh, just kind of grew up hunting and fishing, and it just seemed right when someone was like, yeah, they'll pay you to shoot that gun. I'm like, oh, that's that's cool. I like that. Right. Now, did you know that you wanted to be a bridge crew member? Because that's not usually something people sign up for. Yeah, so you know how everybody jokes about the recruiter got them. Um, I honestly kind of got got by my uh, recruiter. Um, and like you said on your show before, the Army finds a way to like sticking you into places that you somehow you end up loving it, right? Yeah, where you're supposed uh, to be. Yeah, so I went in, and at the time, my brother had gone to active duty, and he was – hating life he was a private down in uh fort bliss texas actually i think at the time he was hating life so when i told him i was going to join he was like for the love of god go reserves and he pretty much told me what you said which is you can try it out if you don't like it just finish your contract get out and if you do end up loving it it's easy to transfer from reserve to active but it's harder to go active to reserve right so so with that in mind i went to the recruiter and i had found 12 bravo the combat engineer, which most people know about. And I said, I want that. And she was like, well, you're joining the reserves. We don't have that in the reserves. It's technically in the guard. She didn't tell me that at the time. Cause obviously she probably wanted me to join then and there, but she goes, but you can join this in 12 Charlie. And she goes, you go to the same OSIT as them. And I was like, Oh really? She's like, yeah, you do everything the same as them, but every now and then you build a bridge. I mean, it wasn't like that. I did way more building bridges than, you know, blowing stuff up, but yeah, I ended up liking it. So that's kind of how I got stuck with 12 Charlie. So when you kind of get shipped off into this boat world, right, as you're going through basic and AIT, are you yeah. starting to think like, man, I got hosed in the beginning or is there a sense of this is actually a lot cooler than I thought? Yeah. So, <laughs> so I was saying like 12 Bravos and 12 Charlie just go to the same OSIT. There's, I think for us, let's say there was like 160 of us in our little OSIT company. Um, I think there was a total of less than 20 of us that were 12 Charlies. So everyone else was 12 Bravos. So every time we finished, when we got the AIT portion, we'd all come back from the end of the day and they're like, yeah, we just, you know, learn how to shotgun breach this door. Yeah. We just did extra demolition. Like, yeah, I'm sitting there going, yeah, I drove a boat today. Yeah. I watched this thing fall into the water. So yeah, there's definitely... <laughs> There's definitely some times I'm laying there like, damn, I really should have gone for that. And I remember at one point they said something. They were like, for any of you guys that are reserve, we can try to get you active. If that's something you want to do now. And I remember like really debating that, like, man, I should just do that so I can go. Maybe I can swap to 12 Bravo. Um, but yeah, there, there was definitely at OSA, I was definitely regretting it a lot. Um, like I said, I ended up coming in, coming to love it a lot later on so you decided to go reserves from the jump I mean, what was going on in your civilian life at this point in time as far as career and everything else um so just i actually i was actually enlisted before i even graduated high school um for some reason i signed a contract before i left high school and they didn't have me sign a new one at meps which apparently a lot of people they do that to so i actually ended up my time in service started four months before I graduated high school. So all this is happening like right at the tail end of high school. So I, I go do my basic training. Um, I'm working at like a coffee shop back home, come home, coffee shop closed. And I start working at, I don't know if you ever heard of it, but Wegmans yeah. grocery store. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah. That's like the high end grocery store. You know, that's like, oh, that's yeah. right up there at the Harris teachers and the whole foods of the world. Yeah, no, they're, they go, <laughs> they go really, uh, really in depth with everything you do. I'm still there. Um, been working my way around different departments and stuff. Uh, cause I've also been knocking out college. So at the beginning of my reserve career, I was doing 
working at Wegmans, doing my drill stuff, and uh, going to a community college. All right. So uh, you you start off your military career, and what year is this? Uh, twenty twelve. Okay, twenty twelve. So Iraq is officially over. Unofficial, yeah, officially, but unofficially pissed, over. Yeah, I'm pissed <laughs> off. Yeah, I get out of basic uh, or so whatever. I show up to my unit, and uh, one of the first things I ask, because obviously all those kids coming straight out of OSU, they're like gung ho, ready to go. And a lot of my friends actually were getting straight deployed out of OSIT going to Afghanistan. Right. So I'm like, hey, when are we going, guys? And my company that I got to had actually just been a part of the drawdown in Iraq. And so, like, the way the cycle works for reserves, it's not for another at least four to six years yep. until they get pulled again for deployment. So they're like, oh, yeah, I'm probably not deploying for this many years. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, so, yeah, I was pretty pissed watching the news. Did you sign up with the notion that you were hoping to deploy quickly? See, like, and that's where some of my friends have been like, so you're stupid for going on reserve. Because in my mind, I wanted a deployment at some point. I wanted to get that under my belt. Because I always thought about, like, my grandpa in Vietnam. And I thought about any dudes that didn't serve in Vietnam. They pro- like at least in my mind, I feel like I would grow up going, man, I never, I ne- I never went and did that. Like there's something that I missed out on. So in my heart, I wanted to deploy, but my brother <laughs> freaked me out, making it sound like it was absolute hell. So I went reserve, and then it was just like, okay, I hope to God I get a deployment. Obviously, looking back, should have just gone straight to active. But <laughs> what did you tell your brother afterwards? Uh, to be honest, I don't, I don't think we're going to jump into this too much, but I actually haven't talked to my brother in a very long time because of uh, some very deep uh, family issues there. Gotcha. So, But if I had the chance, I'd be like, damn it, why don't you freak me out like that? Like, <laughs> so how quickly uh, do you end up getting to Iraq? Because that's your first deployment, correct? Yeah, yeah. So, man, <laughs> uh my life has had a very weird way of timing things at wrong times. So for the first, like what, four years, of my contract, I'm, you know, working my day job. I'm hanging out with friends, trying to be a normal, like 18, 19, 20, whatever year old. Um, and I'm, but I'm constantly putting my name on lists, like our company every now and then I remember standing in line multiple times where companies were getting sent for deployments and they're like you can put your name on here and if they need bodies they'll start pulling from this list uh but since i was e2 they always went they went from the highest ranks first because they wanted obviously i guess the most uh experience right well those so, are usually harder to fill as far as vacancy yeah. are concerned because there's less of them uh okay, yeah um so i'm constantly signing up for deployments not getting any uh and then i start dating this girl and immediately we're like kicking it off and I'm finishing my time at the community college. So now it's time for me to start looking at going out and finishing my actual bachelor's degree, which means going to like an actual big school. So me and her are talking, we're, we start talking about moving in, moving to Richmond, which is where I live now. Um, we get engaged. I'm starting my sign up process for BCU and my platoon sergeant calls me and goes, Hey, yeah, we're going on a deployment. We're going to be leaving like this fallish. I was like, after I finally kind of started to go, you know what? I didn't get my deployment. I guess I'll start my life now. Um, Cause at the time, what I wanted to do was get to a big college and either get into the ROTC program or do green to gold and eventually go officer. So in my, in my mind, I was like, whatever, I'll finish college, go officer. And then maybe I'll get a deployment later on the road. And it's like, as soon as I gave that up in my mind, they were like, Hey, yeah, you're gone now. So I guess it was like four years in until I finally went uh, went to Iraq, got pulled for it. Now, when you're here, you're going to Iraq, are you thinking, why are we going there? Um, You know, honestly, I don't think I really – like because I'd had some friends that had gone back to Iraq even after like the whole drawdown, and I was asking like, what are you doing there, man? Like a lot of them were talking about the, the advise, train advise assist missions, mm-hmm. but they weren't necessarily going out, but they were just teaching Iraqis and then sending them on their way kind of thing. And that's what, that's what I got pulled to do in Iraq. There's a 15 man attachment from my company that we got pulled to go, which was really weird to point with only 15 people. Um, I know like 
most soft units are probably really used to that. But from coming from a conventional reserve multi-roll bridge company and they go, you are now 15 people figure it out. That was kind of weird. But uh, yeah, so we got pulled to do a train wise assist and help the Iraqi engineer soldiers. Cause at this time is when they were uh, about to take in, go into Mosul because Mosul had fallen again. Um, so they, they were trying to do a big train up and that's what they pulled us for. Yeah. So I mean, I, I'm, I'm just sort of wondering what the boat mission is other than, you know, as you said, advise and train, but for mm-hmm. them to do what? So, uh, so we're training them to build like, like, uh, when you first mentioned late earlier, like we, we can cross water, get trucks across, get vehicles across, get mm-hmm. people across. Um, they wanted to do that because and what they ended up doing in Syria too, they were blowing up the bridges around Mosul from what we were told. Um, they blew them up to keep ISIS in there. But then when they wanted to go in and attack, they wanted to get civilians out and obviously like their troops in. And one of the best ways to do it is to get the, the uh, bridge engineers to do their quick rafts. Like you were talking about Um, the guys we ended up training. We found out later that they had been one of the ones that was crossing civilians out. Apparently they got thousands of people out before they started bombing the hell out of the city. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess my first thought was that they just got tired of uh, having to have a single or, you know, only two points of crossing the Tigris and Euphrates, right? So they yeah. know, needed a different way to get across. Um, yeah, I, and that's what we – we trained them actually in conjunction with some uh, British soldiers who are some really cool guys. And uh, we trained them on the water version of the bridge, and they trained them on what was called an acro bridge, which is a pain in the ass to do uh, by hand because – it's like the medium girder bridge or the uh, Bailey bridge, if you've heard of any of those, but bigger and suckier. Um, <laughs> they trained them on that. I don't think any of the Iraqi engineers ended up using the Acro one. I know for a fact they used the water one, though. So you get there. Uh, what is it like? I mean, you know, what were your expectations going in? <laughs> what were you thinking and, and all that? Yeah, so, so this is – I get there 2016. And obviously, like, I've been hearing, like, a lot of my senior NCOs were uh, doing the 12 Charlie mission back, like, initial invasion kind of time stuff. So they're talking about huge convoys, and they're driving, and they get to, like, a crossing they need to do, whole convoy stops, they roll forward, build bridge, get people across, and then they last across, they get back in the convoy, they keep moving, and they're, they're talking about all this crazy stuff, like, you know, they're rolling through towns burning, so me and my friends were all we're we were gung ho as shit by this point. We're oh hell yeah, we're doing this. Like you thought we were taking down Hitler at that point. And then we, we get there and we get uh put on Camp Taji. And I don't know if you're familiar with Taji. Uh, very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> I I, uh, pr- I probably have I would say close to a hundred convoys to that place at some point in time. How uh, well what year were, do you 05, know? 05 to 06 was the first time I was there, and then again in 2011. I think now it's a lot better than it was then. I mean, there was like a mini restaurant there, Green Beans Coffee, mm-hmm. a whole little like boardwalk spot you can like shop on and stuff. Yeah, that Is was that all there. there. The only thing that, the only thing that yep. we heard good about Taji, the one thing we enjoyed, they had a really good chow hall there. Oh, so, yeah. So whenever was, we would stop, they, like, they, yeah. they had like, you know – and for non-army folks listening, like if you were going to go get eggs at a chow hole, it's that stuff that comes out of a carton. It's poured onto a frying, you know, surface, and and it's those those kind of. But the the Taji chow hole would actually make you fried eggs, like actually yeah. crack an egg open for you. Yeah, so no, they were legit. You, they, they were legit yeah. there. Yeah, and they uh their midnight chow was like to die for. Like mm-hmm. I love that. I I ended up gaining a lot of weight on Camp Taji, <laughs> and so and that. And for me and my friends who were like gung ho, ready to like, like we were doing all sorts of different training. We're like doing rucks, we're running in kit, we're, we're trying to make sure we're at the top we can be. And we get there and they're like, yeah, battalions being really careful. They don't want us to even leave Taji. And we're like, oh my God, we're going to sit here for nine months just on Taji. And like, so we were kind of bummed out. Um, we kept calling it the Kuwait of Iraq because that's what it felt like. It just hanging out, like it didn't feel to us it was like didn't feel like a deployment so yeah we get there immediately and we're just kind of like what like 
kind of almost let down in a way, I guess. Obviously, our senior NCOs, though, they're sitting there like, quit asking for more. Like, be thankful that you're not having to deal with the things that you could be. So we were young and naive, though. Sure. And, and I mean, and Taji is right there on the river. So it's not like, I mean, it makes yeah. sense that you were you were there as far as uh, waterways are concerned. Yeah. Um, but what is so day to day life? What's it like for you? On Taji? Oh, God. Uh, well, I mean, as far as like mission wise and training and advisor yeah. training, that kind of stuff. Yeah. What were we? So we got there thinking we were going to like be rotating courses, like teaching like a company send them out, teach another company. They actually ended up only giving us one company to teach. And when they left, they were like, yeah, that's it. That's all we got. So now we're sitting on Taji, like what the hell? So, but when we were teaching, it was pretty fun. We'd wake up super early. And uh, again, I don't know how it was for the earlier days, but there's like a coalition side and then the Iraqi side. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we would drive over to the Iraqi side um, and meet up with them and start training them there. Uh, we did that for a few weeks, and we put we we pretty much built out the twelve Charlie AIT course, but then expanded upon it because like OSIT's like sixteen weeks, I think, and out of the sixteen weeks, obviously nine's at the basic training portion, and then out of the other few weeks left, we split with the twelve Bravos where we all do demolition and route clearance and that kind of stuff. So the true twelve Charlie AIT is like two to three weeks. So we expanded that where we did really more in depth stuff to where it was about a month and a half. I think we gave them. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, we, we did all, we taught them everything about the two bridge systems that we had. Like I said, the Brits were doing their courses with the acro. Uh, we were doing, we did everything. We, we, Oh my God, we were teaching them how to drive. Some of these dudes never even been in a vehicle before. That was terrifying. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it's not even – we're driving a – what's called a CBT. You were in the maintenance, so you may have seen it before, but for anyone that doesn't know, it's like the Hemet, uh, yeah. just mod modified to hold the bridging crap. Um, and theirs were, like, so run down. Some of them, the brakes just didn't even work. They would have to roll the stops. Like, it was – God. So now you're trying to teach someone who's never even sat in a vehicle how to drive while you're going through a, uh, an interpreter. So, yeah, it was a, it was a pain. But really rewarding. We got really close with the guys, and they were bringing us food and gifts a lot. So it was, it was pretty cool. So most mornings we do that, or most days we do that. And then in the evenings, we kind of wrap up AAR for the day and then work out and smoke cigars with the Australians. Pretty much it. What was the uh, combat scenario like? I mean, you know, at this point in time, obviously – there's still bad dudes running around Iraq with guns and bombs mm -hmm. and everything, but w was yeah. any of that like a threat at all to you guys? So when we got there, one of the first things we got uh, was this crazy intel brief that kind of caught me off guard. Cause like we get there and like I said, it looked like a little town almost. So I'm just like, all right, whatever, this is going to be pretty quiet. We do our training. We're done. Um, but these Intel dudes pull us aside. They give us like this whole back brief. And they're telling us, and it's what's weird is like watching the news from like, geez, like exact year ago with the whole uh, Iranian militia stuff. Mm -hmm. They're like, we know they're over there on the Iraqi side. Like we know they're over there. It's just not much we can do about it because then we have to start probing through everyone. And apparently like to get into the Iraqi side was completely tro controlled by the Iraqi army. Like we had no one from coalition helping that at that gate. So anyone could get in and out. Um, so they gave us that brief about it and that, I mean, all that did for us was really, was whenever we drove on the, uh, Iraqi side, hey, shush. whenever we drove on the Iraqi side, we would be full kit and stuff just in case. And there was actually one day, uh, we're out doing training and some IED went off like on the cold or the Iraqi side, we heard it, look over and see a cloud of smoke. And we're like, what the hell was that? And, uh. Or LT gives a call to like the talk back on camp, and they're like, "Yeah, apparently an IED went off." I'm like, "The hell? Like within, like actually within the walls? That's weird." Like, um, but other than that, that's pretty much it. We had the alarm go off a couple times. Uh, honestly, I just went back to sleep. I didn't. It was too muddy. We were there during the raining season, so I was like, "Yeah, there's concrete barriers above us. I'll be fine. I'll just go back to sleep." 
so nothing crazy. So how much uh, time are you there for initially? Oh, uh, actually, before we move on, I do mm-hmm. kind of want to – the so like I said, we were working with these British engineers. Okay. Um, I don't know if you heard about this. I know it was big news for them. I don't think it reached the states here. So the British engineers we're working with, we're hanging out with them doing like KLEs as we're preparing to do all this training. We're talking with their leadership or with the Iraqi leadership. We're doing all this in junction with the British. And so obviously every time we go over to the KLEs, our leadership, their leadership walks away. And now it's just the lower enlisted sitting around, you know, messing around. So we got really close with some of those dudes just sitting there joking and asking each other about different cultural differences and stuff. There's this dude, Lance Corporal Hetherington. I hope I said that right. Um, hilarious dude. Awesome dude. Always smiling. But uh, <clears throat> one day in their chew, uh, like the combat housing units for everyone, him and what ends up being actually his best friend, his, his daughter's godfather. So they're like super close. Um, they're messing around with their Glocks and the kid accidentally shoots Lance Corporal Hetherington in the heart. Uh, so he, unfortunately he passed away and, uh, that was pretty, pretty significant. I just want to make sure I say it cause he was a good kid and, uh, right. Yeah. So that, that was pretty weird, but I mean, it wasn't like I went, Oh my God, it could have been me, but it was kind of like, like the next day we get told that we're like, Holy shit. Like, well, I mean, look, I mean, it's really simple. I mean, you, you know, you're in the face of danger, right? As, as we just talked yeah. about, there are things going on around you that yeah. are supposed to kill you. That's not supposed yeah. to kill somebody who is on yeah. your side, right? That's not the way yeah, it's supposed yeah. to happen. So it, it, there's a there's a whole bunch of frustration and anger and, and a whole lot of other oh, things yeah. that go with that. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, certainly it's it's significant. Um, you know, it's something obviously you'll never forget. And uh, mm. it, it just it fe- felt like it, it could have been prevented, right? I mean, that's really what oh, yeah. more than anything uh, is the issue. Yeah, we were the, actually the day before that, or I guess the day of – the same day, like in the afternoon, later at night, that's what happened, uh, unfortunately. But we're we're joking with each other, we're whatever, and I can't remember what kind of guns they carried, what their rifles were, but they're very different from ours. And so we both are playing like, "Hey, can I see yours? Yeah, let me see yours." I'm holding them, and me and my friends were like checking that it's empty, we're making sure the like complete muzzle awareness, and if and a lot of them were weren't doing muzzle awareness like at all and we had a couple times be like hey man can you just and like we kind of like lower the barrel because they're like looking at it but aiming it um and it was weird because we were like man i don't like that and then later that night that happened we're like oh my god that's weird like it's kind of felt almost like foretold it was kind of that was the weirdest part of thing about it because you're just kind of like oh shit like um kind of odd and then we were also were there when uh weston lee lieutenant lee I don't know if you're familiar with that name. No. So a couple of weeks after Lance School for Hetherington, uh, Weston Lee was an officer with, I believe it was the 82nd. Um, mm-hmm. He unfortunately passed away from an IED in Mosul. Uh, they were out helping out like the Iraqi infantry and they got hit by an IED. Um, so that one was the one that kind of gave a couple of us that were being like really gung ho. We kind of went, Hmm. Yeah, this is real now. Like this, is this, there can be things that will happen. Like, so that, that was the one I think that really got us more where it's like, Oh, Oh man. So, um, but yeah. So and what's I the think, time span that all this stuff is happening? Yeah. So we got to Iraq in December, 2016 Lance Corporal Harrington. I want to say it was like January 2nd and Weston Lee was like a handful of weeks later. Uh, so all this is like right up front when we got to Camp Taji. Yeah, and Weston Lee's early 2017 uh, is, is what yeah. I'm seeing. So yeah. uh, how long were you supposed to be there? At this point, they're only nine-month deployments, right? Yep. Yeah, it was nine months. Okay. Um, so we were supposed to be, it would have been December to, I mean, we got back home in September. So I think that's the same time frame that we were supposed to be. So something like that. So yeah, nine-month deployment. So you finished that whole deployment out? So that so that's the point deployment. All one deployment, we went from Iraq to Syria. So 
Okay, that was so all in the same deployment. What's the what's the transition to Syria? When does that happen? Um, I'm trying to remember dates now. Actually, I want to say it was April, late April, that we flew into Kuwait and started sitting there waiting to go to Syria. Did um, they did they tell you why you're going to Syria at this point? Uh, yeah, yeah. They, it, it started off with, um. All that stuff was happening where, like, you know, we shot the cruise missiles. There was, like, that gas attack and all that stuff with a with Assad. Yeah, yeah. Like, going to his own people. And we're watching, going, wow, man, that's crazy. And, like, not thinking anything of it. One of our guys jokingly goes, I bet we go to Syria at some point. And I think he meant we as in, like, we as in American Like troops. the United States, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think we already knew, like, SF was there. Uh, actually, we did because I was at that time – one of them got caught with a patch on, which actually something similar happened to us, unfortunately. But so what do you mean? He says that <laughs> um, well, you kind of left a cliffhanger there. So I, I'm, I'm obliged yeah, to ask about it. So later when we get to Syria, um, one of my friends is holding a YPG flag that we, he had traded something for. And one of the YPG soldiers took a picture of it and YPG? posted it online. YPG. What's that? Uh, oh my God, I can't remember the name of their overarching thing. Uh, the Kurds, you know, you okay. know, the Kurds Kurdish forces. Soldiers. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. There's the YPG, but they technically fall under something else. And at the time it was very, I guess, debated that we should be working with the Kurds. Mm -hmm. It kind of turned into one of these things where it's like the enemy in the, of my enemy is my friend. Um, so at the time, there, the some Navy SEAL like a year or two earlier had got caught with a YPG patch on his helmet, and it was and it made the news um, for a little bit, and then now here's my friend a few years later, uh, and at the time they were only saying like yeah we only have SF here whatever, and then all of a sudden my friend pops up on Twitter holding a YPG flag with you know hashtag the crap out of because this Kurdish soldier was ecstatic that an American was holding his flag so. Yeah, that was uh, by the by the time we got back from that mission, it had already trickled its way down to the uh, uh, the KLZ was where we were on. The guy that was like running, I guess, Camp KLZ, I guess you could call it. It already made its way to him. So by the time we downgraded our gear, our uh, our CO uh, first sergeant comes storming our tent, <laughs> pissed off. It was uh, yeah, it was it was a mess. Get back to the part where you guys make the transition to Syria. Oh, yeah. So so it starts off with them being like, hey, you know, we got the American troops. Like pretty much our, our leadership's like, you've seen the news. You know there's stuff happening. They're like, they've got troops over there. And they're running into issues with the bridges. And the whole entire time we're like, oh, my God. Like we never thought we'd be like this valuable to them. But so we ended up having a bunch of briefings and meetings where we were going to um, the rooms where you can't like bring cell phones in at all. You can only bring like pen and paper. It's like locked when you go in. And if you know what I'm talking about, I think it's called like a sip room or something like that. Or a skiff, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we're going in there and they're giving us PowerPoints and stuff of what's happening on the ground and why they need our help. And at the time, they just, they weren't, they, at the time, they weren't thinking about pulling us there. They were just going, this is the issues. Here's some topographic maps. Here's what we have available. And they're pretty much going, how would you cross this? And we're like, <laughs> like I remember a few times we're like, man, that's a loaded question because we don't know. And we start spewing out. We don't know what the far uh, far side looks like with the, the advancement or the approach, like what kind of material is the approach. You said you have wood. What kind of wood is it? Like, we're asking all these like in-depth questions and I, I can imagine on their side, they're just like, Jesus Christ, just how do you, how do you want to build this bridge? Um, so we had all these meetings and stuff where we would sit down and like, we're looking at maps where we have all these measurements, like we're able to like zoom in super close and we're trying to figure out if we were there, what would we do to get troops across this spot? Uh, the, the major problem was there was these canals all over Syria to carry water. And again, a lot of the bridges have been blown up, whether by ISIS in a retreat or by us to stop them from, from coming, coming back across, over. Yeah. Um, what 
What ends up making it worse, though, is when they got into Raqqa and they took Raqqa and the bridges were blown, a lot of the civilians couldn't get out, too, now. Um, so they were trapped in there. Um, so so we're, we're all in Iraq, kind of watching from the sideline as they're asking us, like, hey, what would you do? And we keep we keep giving them the best advice and, but we're like, we, we kind of like, I think at one point someone finally goes, just tell them we'll come. And, and somehow that worked where they're just like, yeah, you know what? You guys come over here. So bunch of 15 reservists, uh, just bounce over to Syria just for, for the heck of it. Um, cause they're just like, we need you. So we picked up our stuff and just, uh, flew to Kuwait and sat there until we could get a flight. And yeah, landed in Syria, probably late April, early May. So now this is a completely different mission set. <laughs> oh yeah. So we're sitting in Taji and we're just kind of like, yeah, we're getting paid for this. We're doing our thing. Sure. We just like started to accept that our deployment was going to be a very calm deployment. And then they said that and we're like, all right, well, we just saw all that stuff with the gas attack. So this is going to be interesting. Um, so yeah, we we go back into like a hardcore train mode. We're doing man for like a month before we left. I think every day we're running through TTPs. We're checking gear. We're putting together like a quick CLS class for everybody. We're going reaching out to someone else on uh, Camp Taji to put together this class. And it was actually what was really cool about it was kind of you know when they say that what's that saying like it takes a village to raise a baby. Mm -hmm. Um, we were the baby and Camp Tazi was the village because we would go to like, I, I found this random, uh, national guard SF dude who happened to be on Camp Tazi for a contract, uh, specifically to do like different route clearance stuff. So I'm talking to him. I was like, yeah, we're, we're headed to Syria. Um, and we're trying to buff up our knowledge. Think you can do anything. So he ends up putting together quite a few classes for us and sits us down and he had a guy that was in Syria at the time. So he got all the information he could from him and he put together a whole PowerPoint on what the current, uh, TTPs for their IEDs and crap were. So definitely became like this whole, you know, the 15 of us running around to different people going, just tell us what, you know, like help us out here. Um, so it was definitely, it went from us being bored to very busy, very fast. <laughs> When you get on ground in Raqqa, um, well, first of all, are you actually in Raqqa? No. So, Kobani. Have you heard of that? No. Uh, Kobani's – yeah, let me try to remember my uh, geography for there. If you're looking at Raqqa on the map of Syria, if you go to the north, uh, west, not too far, there's Kobani. Um, and I think uh, without – giving away too many details of where it was, although I guess it's not owned by America anymore. Got it. I don't know. The politics over there got weird fast. Um, we were on a place called KLZ. Uh, pre it pretty much was like a big fob, I guess. It wasn't, definitely wasn't Camp Taji. Uh, that's for right. sure. Um, like, Chow Hall was just a Chow Hall tent. We were staying in a tent. Uh, actually, it was all tents, so whatever. Um, but, for me and my friends, I've been asking for a real deployment. Like now we we're actually getting it. And to be more or less, we we're like really excited to actually be getting to our actual mission. So, All right. Well, and, and Raqqa is right on a river as well. It's right on a body of water. It's actually yeah. it's some of the Euphrates, yeah. as a matter of fact. Um, yeah. So it's, yeah. it's right there. It, obviously, as you mentioned, um, and if you look at the map, there's, there's tons of bridges uh, right mm -hmm. there on, on both sides, on, you know, this both sides of the Euphrates that cross it. So, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, that part makes a ton of sense, obviously geographically, but, well, uh, you know what, you know what, we never, I never got a chance to bridge on the Euphrates. Really? <laughs> Our whole entire time there was just dealing with these stupid canals that were like everywhere. Yeah, it's, sure. Um, and since these canals were just a canal, they're just too big and just too deep that, you know, trying to just ram through with your Matt V that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. Um, but they're just too small that our normal bridge mission, which is like dropping boats and everything, would make zero sense. There wasn't enough room to do it, really. So that's when we had to start making it up. And we literally were built. We I don't know how, 
but uh, our first sergeant had this book called like Unconventional Bridging Methods. Um, that was an official army book. The army has a book on everything apparently. Um, and we literally sat down and we were hand designing bridges and how to, and figuring out how to make them pre-make them and then drive them to the spot and drop them fast and get out. Um, because now, were these bridges for people yeah. to cross or vehicles as well? Both. both. Okay. Uh, we, we built them in mind with, with the mindset of vehicles, obviously. Yeah. I, we, there's a mil, there's a thing called a military load class on every bridge. And the highest obviously is an Abrams tank. If you can cross that, you can cross literally everything else. Right. So whenever we did the math, we did the math as if we wanted to cross an Abrams tank. Uh, Cause we didn't know like, the SF dudes had all sorts of different vehicles. Some of them were like those big, uh, I think they're called like panders. It's mm -hmm. like, it's like, a, God, I think it had like four axles or something on it. So we're like, that thing's got to be really heavy, especially when they load it out, armored out, full of people. So we wanted to make sure it was going to be strong enough to hold whatever crossed it. What's the sort of uh, activity like or enemy activity like while you're there? Uh, it was interesting a lot of like uh sleeper cell kind of activity where it's just like sporadic things um by some miracle we never actually got shot at so that that's that's good in a way i know again young naive, naive me and my friends at the time were like oh my god is this going to be another de uh, boring deployment but uh yeah they're doing things like they were making like the villages and stuff wherever we would drive on our convoys to go out and do this they would burn tires. So you would, whenever you pass a spot, they'd light this big fire. And then you could look back and see a path of where you just went essentially lit up by these uh, giant, like, like smoke billing out of these little villages. So you knew that there was weird stuff going on. Like one time, one of our Kurdish homies, he uh, chased down and tackled this kid because he was filming us. And sure enough on his camera was on, on his little camera or phone, or whatever, he had all sorts of, videos of us driving by and what we were doing. So definitely unique. Definitely at that point, you're like, yeah, this isn't Taji. This isn't vacation anymore. This is actually serious. Yeah. So as far as uh, operational tempo day to day, I'm, it's much different than Iraq and, and clearly oh, you're man. a lot busier. Yeah. yeah. So for the first, I would say two and a half months at, at the least we were every other day out from KLZ. Our, our schedule essentially was go out, recon the bridge, check it out, see what kind of materials we need, how big we need to do it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we come back <clears throat> immediately start building and well, planning and building and getting this thing prefabricated. And then most of the time, the next day we wake up super early get everything loaded up um, onto civilian uh, long bed trucks and we drive out and put it in place. And then next day we do it again is kind of how it went. So it was almost like an every other day, sometimes back to back days, if we could prefabricate everything enough well uh, with enough time. And so, so you're just, you're, I mean, you're dropping bridges in place and leaving. You're not taking them back up with you. No, 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 no. Yeah. Def very different, very different from what most 12, 12 Charlie's do on deployments. So we're, and we're not even using our normal equipment. Like everything we're doing, we're, so we used, uh, Connexes mm -hmm. and we would use, and cause we couldn't get like metal or even something to really cut with metal. So we were making I beams and such out of wood that we would like hammer together like crazy. So you'd have a few stacks of wood hammered together, cut it down and make it into, uh, an I beam. And so we're going inside the Connex and building the stuff inside of it. So then when you go drive across, the weight gets distributed like it should, according to the uh, unconventional manual that we had. And so, yeah, we would pre-build these. And since they're on a Connex, all you had to do is pick it up, put it on a flatbed truck, drive it out. Get The, the crane was the hardest part because you'd have to find a spot to put the stupid crane. Um, you drive out, you get the dude apart, you get the crane out, drop that in. And then we use flat racks, which is essentially just the bottom of a Connex. And we put those on top in a very uh, specific spot. And then that's how you could drive across. So we go out, 
plop, put those in, and then get out. Now, you said earlier you didn't get shot at, but I'm, I'm yeah. picturing you guys driving somewhere, uh, you know, through these cities in Syria, yeah. wearing yeah. American uniforms, looking like Americans look, and just mm-hmm. sort of making a whole lot of noise, and no one seemed to care. That seems odd to me. So there was a lot of times, and it kind of it got weird because there would be times where we'd leave and then find out later, like, yeah, they came, they came through and like shot up the area or something like that. So it was, we often, or there was one time we got out to a site and are like, I think, I don't remember who was out there with us, but somehow we were communicating with the Kurdish guys that were at that area. And they were like, yeah, like an hour before you came here, some dude drove up in suicide debt in the middle of us. And it's like, what the heck dude? Like, so there were so many times that we just missed it which was very strange um the uh there was a few times that we didn't necessarily just miss it so we were doing this one uh bridge site so i didn't we didn't get shot at but uh had some other close calls so we're doing this one bridge and it's in a spot that we all think is already horrible because on one side like as you approach the bridge that we're fixing because sometimes we just did fixes. We didn't actually fully uh, build one. We just fixed one that was already there. So as you're approaching this this town kind of thing, um, there's first of all, there's a giant sign that had been painted with the ISIS flag. So we're like, cool, that's welcoming. Um, and it's, as you're coming towards the bridge, you're driving through complete open fields, just nothing around. And then just on the other side of the bridge, on on a hill is the village looking down at you. So it was, we knew we would have to be just standing on that bridge. And from one direction is we could be attacked from. And the other side was completely open. So if we turn around to get out, we're completely open the whole entire time. So I remember we were talking about it just kind of like, this is weird. It kind of feels weird. Uh, but at the time, like we always did our things alone. Just this, 15, 16 of us, because eventually we got a medic added to us. That was nice. Um, we're doing our own thing. We're probably providing our own security. We're providing our own uh, mini sweeps when we park. We make sure there's no IEDs, whatever. Um, but we always knew nearby, and I don't know if it was always planned or it just happened to be we would be in that area. Uh, a lot of the SF teams that were out there, they would be nearby. A lot of the Rangers, too. So we're sitting there alone, but we know they're like inside that village, the SF guys. So we're like, whatever, we'll be fine. So we're on this bridge and I don't know where I'm standing on top of one of the trucks. Cause I'm helping guide the crane to pick up pieces. And I look over cause I see movement just in time to watch a civilian vehicle right next to our bridge detonate. Um, <laughs> which, which was nuts. And I can like replay in my head over and over again like because i i looked over just to, just in time to see truck go to nothing and i'm like oh, and my my immediate reaction was i laughed and looked at someone that was near me and went did you see that and they me was like get the hell down and so we immediately we, we like we we did what we usually what we trained to do was react to contact because we we're like all right detonation is this was that a pre-detonated uh, suicide uh, V-bid was that a distraction are they blowing up there because something's happened over here so we all start taking our cover um, and almost immediately like everybody knows this like the civilians in the areas will go hide when there's something going on yep yeah and, and so I immediately start pointing out to some of the guys next to me I'm like there's dudes on top of these buildings like they're standing there not like freaking out they're not looking over at what just blew up. They're looking at us, but the ROEs at the time were like super strict. So I can't do anything. Literally our our ROE at the time was if they shoot at you, you can shoot back. So I'm like, cool. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, so we're watching these guys and whatnot and they never shot or anything. We found out later that I think it was some Marine group went through, And somehow found out that, like, they found tapes of them recording us reacting to that detonation. So 
we def we we have really solid evidence that that was they planned that because they wanted to see what we would would do in reaction to, uh, which seems to be a common thing that they do anyways. Um, so luckily, like so that kind of clears up. We we took a cover, we pulled our securities. Um, I started. I remember I looked over and everybody's on the line looking the direction we always thought something would come from. We were like, if something happens, it's definitely got to come from that way. So look over and everybody's looking that way. So I tagged the two specialists next to me. I'm like, yo, we should turn around because everybody's looking one direction. Um, and that's when I look and I could see the dudes on the buildings. Um, but so that calms down. We go, all right, well, like, and I remember someone said, like, what do we do now? And we're like, we got to finish this. Like, we don't just go home because we're scared. So we kept doing our thing. And within the hour or something, by this point, the SF team that was in the little village city thing, they'd come, they'd come down because they were like, all right, something's happening. Let's be here to help these guys out. And I'm talking to their combo guy because I got stuck being combo for my detachment and I didn't know shit about combo. Um, I just kind of got out. I think I was just the guy to sign off for things. They needed someone to sign. Um, but I ended up actually learning it. So I'm talking to their combo guy. And I'm asking them, hey, man, I don't know how to get this antenna on my truck working. I've never messed with a Matt V before. So me and him climb up on top of this dirt bomb to look at, to try to see this antenna and see where the wires are going. And they go, hey, you guys, can you get off of there? We're going to use that dirt berm to backfill this dirt in for the bridge to kind of fill this hole here. Like, yeah, sure. We hop down, and one of my buddies who's driving the loader drives into the uh, – it's just dirt berm and we picks it up. There's a huge ass IED in the bucket of the loader. And we're like, Oh my God. Like, come like, it was almost like a, can we get a break today? Like kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so he immediately just dips out of that thing. <laughs> like he didn't, I don't think he said anything. Cause like, I mean, he was right there with it. So apparently he just walked by, uh, he walked past our, our detachment platoon sergeant and just goes, my rifles in the, the tractor just so you know, and just kept walking. <laughs> he was like, just so you know, that's where my rifle is. And then he just kept walking. <laughs> um, and again, my gut reaction, I kind of laughed about it. So I turned to the dude, uh, the 18 echo that was helping me. And I go, huh, crazy. Right. And he looked, he looked serious and he looked like, Oh shit. Like, and some, when I looked at him, I went, Oh my God, this is real. Like kind of, that's I think when it really sunk down, I was like, all right, like after that detonation, after me standing on this ID, this is a real deployment. This definitely is a really real deployment by this point. Yeah, right. Um, and that 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 whole day just kind of like, even though, and this is kind of something that I'm glad to be on here to talk about because this is something that I kind of had to work through and work with a lot talking to a therapist. I wasn't shot at the detonation. Didn't touch me. I wasn't hit the IED I stood on. Didn't go off, but man, that day really would go on to not be a good memory for me moving forward. If that makes any sense. Sure does. Um, and, and that, that's kind of what, like, I'm glad to be on here to say this because I hope at least one person hears it and kind of goes, all right, you know what? That makes sense because for the longest time, like I got home from employment after that. So, so after that, all the other things, there's another ID that kind of goes off, but it's a little bit further away from us. Um, and there was a couple hairy moments where locals, not sure who they were exactly, but they were getting way too close and angry with me that I had to kind of like shove them off and be in like, the next step, I was like, I'm going to kill one. I'm going to kill one of these dudes if he doesn't. Because they were, they were getting really angry. Um, so other than that, it's kind of kind of a simple deployment. Just very busy. Always looking for IEDs and stuff. Especially after that one day, it was very like, okay. Because I usually was the guy that got out first or one of the first. Um, it's like if we did a recon, me, my commander... And then uh, one of our uh, 
section sergeants or sorry, staff sergeants who he was like a really good guy at like recon and doing the measurements. We'd go out walk. And for me, it was kind of just a good thing. So kind of either do you lend in hand or I was looking for like IEDs and stuff. Often if we got to a spot uh, and we wanted to park the trucks off the road, I would walk off the side of the road first, look around and go, yeah, should be good. And tell them when to park. So I go through that whole deployment uh, doing that a lot. Um, there was actually one time we went out and did this bridge. We started it. Something broke. So we had to go back, stay the night in a, the nearest village. Then the next day we went out there. All of a sudden there was this new IED put in the ground right where we had been parking. So stuff like that where you're like, I know they're watching us. I know they're nearby, that kind of thing. But again, I'm not getting shot at. My life, I don't know how to explain it. Like, I feel threatened. I feel scared. But at the same time, in my mind, and for a while after, I'm like, but this is nothing compared to what some of my friends have gone through. Like, I had one friend from basic training who got shot in the head and survived. And then went through some intense physical therapy to learn to like walking in things, you know. So I'm sitting here like now being scared in a way, overly cautious, like coming home and reacting very strangely to things. And I'm sitting there going, but nothing happened. It was like it wasn't anything. Um, well, it, it's not that nothing happened. I mean, that, that, that's foolish to say nothing happened because. Mm-hmm. Your, your life is forever changed from the experience that you went through. So something happened. Uh, mm-hmm. And and the I don't think people realize, especially people who have never been to combat, and a lot of times you don't realize it until after the fact, but the anxiety that you build up on a day-to-day basis um, is, is sometimes more than you recognize and more than you can handle. And that mm-hmm. anxiety, when it winds up, I mean, just kind of think of it as a as, – uh, you know, if you're, you're you're twisting a rubber band, you know, around two pencils, right? And you just keep twisting yeah. the pencil and the rubber band keeps tightening up tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. And tighter. Eventually, you know, it's going to flip back in the other direction. It just doesn't know where yeah. and when. And that's, and, yeah. and again, it's it, it, it might not be enough pressure to snap the rubber band. It might not be enough pressure for something, quote, bad to happen. But mm-hmm. still, that anxiety has to unwind at some point. So yeah. I, I don't. I, I would disagree that nothing happened. You nothing physically happened. I mean, look, mm-hmm. physically, I returned from combat pretty okay, uh, mm-hmm. especially compared to some other people. But mm-hmm. that yeah, doesn't exactly. that yeah. doesn't change yeah. the experiences that I went through and and what I still carry with me. So mm-hmm. and and everybody handles it differently, and that's kind of what we're learning yeah. or what we have learned about PTSD and what we have learned about you know uh, a, a lot of the mental trauma that that you know, veterans and soldiers and troops have gone through, uh, through 20 years of war. So Mm -hmm. I I wouldn't say nothing happened to you. I just, your, your response to what went on around you manifests itself in different ways for everybody. Exactly. And and there's some guys from my deployment. I love every single one of them. Just if they hear this three tenths detachment task force havoc, I love these guys. Um, and I've talked to some of them like since then, cause I, for a while, I knew I wasn't feeling right, but it, I kept thinking it was just obvious. Like this is such a, it's kind of become cliche at this point, but for real, I was like, it's just me. Like for some reason I reacted this way. I like, I'm not going to bring it up. I'm not going to bring it up. And then finally one day I asked someone and I was like, Hey man, is it kind of sat with you weird that we were so close so many times, this kind of thing. And a lot of them have been like, yeah, no, yeah. It's kind of, I think about it a lot. Um, so definitely whoever's listening to this you're not the only one thinking whatever it is that you're thinking um but kind of going back to what we were saying about you know it's not nothing so i come home from deployment and i honestly for the longest time and i still kind of like struggle with this at times i almost view when i stood on that ied as a time that i should have died like fate messed up kind of in a way it's a really stupid way of thinking about it but that really bothered me that day in that kind of in that kind of way for some reason and then it manifested itself to this anytime something bad happened i'd be like see i should have been dead like that kind of 
it's a stupid mentality, and especially now that I've come out the other side of it, I can say that because I'm like, wow, I thought like that at one point. Um, but it wasn't until I was really pushed to go talk to a therapist, and I finally told her, I was like, I don't think I should be here. I didn't go through anything. And the way she put it, and I hope, again, I hope someone hears this and kind of goes, oh, that's a good way of thinking of it. Like, if you broke your leg real bad, you're going to the hospital because you, you need to get there. You need to get taken care of. Like, you need immediate help. Otherwise, it's not going to heal right. Things are going to be wrong. If I got shot, I'm also supposed to be going to the hospital. We're both going to the same place. We're both going to get immediate help. Yeah, I got shot. Maybe that's a little bit worse than breaking your leg real bad, but you're both going to the hospital. You both need immediate attention. And that's what my therapist told me. That kind of made me finally go, okay, fine. I'll admit that I need to keep coming here kind of thing. Uh, She was like, pretty much to relate it back, she was like, you know, someone gets shot on deployment. Yes, they'll probably have some mental struggles from that because, you know, they actually got shot. She goes, but then there's you. You didn't get shot. You didn't get shot at, but you still have some things you need to work out. So I thought that was a good way that she put it. No, and, and again, I think that's I think that's fair. Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. so what is the sort of result of the therapy? Because I'm always curious how people react to it. Yeah, so I so I came back September 2017. Um, we're do you? I know your guard. Did you ever deploy with guard? Or was all your deployments active duty? No, they were both with the guard. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. I left active duty just prior to nine eleven. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So, okay. Uh, yeah. so you know the whole demo process. Mm-hmm. Um, apparently, it's a bit different for active duty soldiers because they just kind of go back to their yep. normal base. Yep. But for us guard reserve, we kind of go through this whole like, it's almost like you're ETSing to go back. Um, and I remember. We, we ha- everybody had to at one point sit down with a psychiatrist or therapist. I don't know what they were. And mental health professional is the is the term yeah. you're looking for. Yeah, yeah. So I sit down with him, and he's like, "Is there anything that sticks out to you?" And I immediately was like, "No." Well, there's this day, and I brought that up. And again, I'm still kind of thinking about it in these terms of like, it's not that bad. It could have been worse. Like whatever. So I explained the day. And he's like, he, he, he checked me off to say I was okay, but he wrote in the block, please go to the VA when you get home. And I was like, I don't know what that's supposed to mean. So I ignored it and moved on. Um, so I get home and I immediately started picking up drinking way too much. Uh, I stopped working out a lot. Um, cause I used to work out a lot. Uh, well, I was just completely different for some reason. I came home just vastly different and started struggling immediately. Uh, I didn't. I didn't go. To, I didn't start going to actually get help until probably a year out after I got home. So, mm-hmm. kind of didn't handle that the right way. Right. Now you actually leave the military shortly th- thereafter, right? Yeah, which was probably even worse. Um. So yeah, I get home September twenty seventeen. Orders aren't technically done until like late October, the way they write our orders for deployments like that, I guess. Um, and then my unit's like, since you just came home from deployment, you don't have to show up to like two or three drills. I can't remember how much it yep, was. It's three months. You get 90 days off. Yeah. So my next drill I show up is my immediate last drill. The next month. So by the time I show up, it's January of 2018. Uh, February 2018 is when my active time and then IRR starts. So yeah, I show up to one last drill. I think I showed up in civilians just because I was like, I don't, I, I'm now, I don't care. So I just show up to one last drill. I showed up and a lot of the kids that were under me when I was like a squad leader and team leader, they're like, Oh, Hey man, yeah, we missed you. Whatever. And like, we're talking and I go, yeah, well, this is my last drill. See you later. And they're like, Whoa, what? And I had gone completely from, army loving it to i i purposely was unfollowing any military related pages uh at the time i used to listen to a lot of like the drink bros podcast field craft survival like mike lover uh i started deleting those off my feeds i 
for some reason just absolutely went 100 percent 180 and said i don't want to be i i don't i don't need military i want to just go on and move on with my life um which was again probably not the way to handle any of it um so yeah so yeah i get out almost immediately after coming home in retrospect why do you think he did that back then I honestly, I, I'm not too sure. I think the most of it is I just had a really bad taste in my mouth from deployment. Um, I kind of started seeing, I, I don't like to be this guy, but we all have heard this where it's like the army's changing. I don't like where it's going, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. I wasn't in that long. I, I don't think I was in long enough to really be able to say that, but deployment really shined a light on how odd the army really is like i'm on i'm in the middle of syria i come back after like a long ass day and they're like hey tomorrow before you go do this we've got to do a sharp brief i'm like i what like i don't care i've got to worry about all these other things like why are we worrying about that um not saying sharp isn't important but it's like we're in the middle of like day in day out stuff and we're like yo everyone stop for a second like it, it's it's getting really weird and there's a few times where it was like we're, we're about to go do a mission and our battalion just decided to say the battalion that took over for us i'm not going to mention them i don't want to badmouth anybody um but they all of a sudden like call down to the engineer talk and talk to my commander like hey you can't go on mission today and it seemingly because they were like, we just decided there was too much of a risk. And we're like, yeah, there's a risk. We're, we're here every day. There's every day a risk. So it just was very, very annoying. Um, yeah, I think I just gotten really burnt out, I guess is a good way to, good way to say it. Do you regret it in retrospect? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So all this happens... I pulled the typical, I was a sergeant at the time, but I pulled the uh, private move. Was, I got married right before deployment. Um, so yeah, I come home uh, a bit different, I guess, in a way. I didn't feel like I was, but I was. And so we just, me and my wife at the time, we didn't click. And uh, so that kind of started falling apart. It didn't really fall, fully fall apart for another like two or three years. Um, but but what ends up happening is I chose to get out because I'm like, well, I'm done with this and I want to fully be involved in my marriage. I don't want to leave her again. You know, we're buying a house. So I went full command on that. And then now I'm divorced and not in the service anymore either. So yeah, kind of looking back, I go, I wish I just chose to stay. Um, but honestly, you know, we all, I'm here sitting here talking to you in my, because of the choices I made. Uh, I hate to say I regret it because that's kind of a slap in the face to who I am now. But yeah, if I could go back, I may change it, but I kind of like who I am now. So I don't know. You can get back in, you know. So actually I have a disability (laughs) rating now. Um, Okay. You can still get back in with one. I can. Um, but at this point, I got a disability so, rating too. <laughs> so I kind of went up and so to be, to clarify, I went up and down on this. So, cause I have, I have, this is funny. So while I was IRR, I went back to my unit and said, you and had, uh, had a lot of told you so's. I went, Hey, you're right. I miss it. Take me back. And so they do. And then almost immediately, I mean, like a couple months later, um, I got this awesome offer to go to this cool, like IT school near me. And I go, Hey, you know what guys, never mind on that. And I, <laughs> at the last second, didn't sign something that would have made me actually stay in. And so I miss it. I definitely do. There's times I wish I was back at the unit, but right now, now I've got like, I, I've recently moved. So now I'm closer to friends. I've got friends. Like I've, started opening myself back up to people. I've been doing my graphic design stuff. And while I miss it, I miss the guys. Kind of now I'm content with who I am without it. 
if that makes sense. So I kind of, kind of was a roller coaster of, uh, I got out, I hated it. I was like, no, I'm never going back. Then I was like, yeah, okay, I'll go back in. And now I'm back to like, you know what? I don't need that. I'm just going to keep doing me. So if that makes sense, like, no, it does. Pretty. It does. I mean, listen, yeah. and for what it's worth, I mean, you sound happy. Like, it's not like I'm, I'm hearing, you know, as you talk about where you are right now, your sort of voice picks up a little bit and, and you seem content with where you are. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. just kind of judging off what I'm hearing from you. So I, I, I well, regret always sounds like a bad word, um, mm-hmm. you know, because yeah. it, it, it always connotates to an idea that um, we missed out or we did something wrong or we should have fixed it. I, listen, I mean... It, Yes, you'd like to do things differently, and sure, um, there's always the, the, the road not taken, but uh, much like how the Army is supposed to put you where you are, if you're a believer in God, I'm sure God has you where you're supposed to be right now. And so, mm. you know, uh, the, all the experiences led you to where you are, and, and, and if you're content with that, then I think that's all you need to focus on at this point. Mm. And, and it, like you say I sound happy. If you talk to me like, if you talk to me like an exact year ago right now, or even six months ago, you probably want to be saying that it's taken a lot to be happy between the divorce. I said, there's no bad blood between me and her, but it still kind of rocked me to my core. Sure. All, all while, all while I was still trying to like really comprehend and understand what I was feeling from deployment. If, um, not trying to sound like super dramatic, but like, cause, cause I, I showed up to my therapy and the doctor was like, oh, you definitely have PTSD. And I was like, no. That, and I think I literally told – at that time, it was a guy. And I, I think I literally told him, no, uh, there's no way I have PTSD. And I said, no. And I never went back, um, which was probably the wrong answer uh, to do that. Um, so, yeah, so went to it, then left. And then I finally went back later when my wife first was like, hey, I'm leaving. Because I hit really rock bottom at that point. Like. I was riding on the rock bottom. She did that. And then I just kind of like face planted in it. Um, so from there, I, I finally actually went back to it and started going, all right, you know what, you know, what can you do to help me? Like I'm having a hard time. Um, and thank God I did that. <laughs> right. So, well, look, I mean, you was never a finished product, right? Not, not you particularly, totally. but you, as in all of us, should never be a finished product. You don't get to a point and go, hey, well, I'm perfect. I may as well just sit where I am. So, oh, yeah. you know, from that standpoint, um, you know, the progress that you're making, I think, speaks more to uh, not where you were, but how you got to where you are now. And mm-hmm. so from that standpoint, you know, I commend you for, for having the guts to go back because it's not easy. You know, there's oh, no, a lot of people weird. who don't want to face those demons, man. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, I give you all the credit in the world uh, for doing that. And again, you know, uh, the decisions you make got you to here and, and um, they'll carry you going forward. You know, I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's just like your rucksack that you throw on, you put everything in there and you carry it with you. I mean, it's life is sort of the mm-hmm. same way. It's a, you know, corny little metaphor here. But in the same respect, it's a. Uh, the, the minute you can download some of those experiences and get them out of your ruck, it's almost like, you know, you don't have to carry them around anymore. You just know where they mm-hmm. are. And uh, the, the, the easier it is for you to do that and the more of those therapy sessions you go to, I'm sure, um, you know, uh, that rucksack will get a b- little bit lighter. Oh, yeah. No, it definitely. Once I started, once when the therapist was like, you're pretty much, she was like, you're right to feel off. Like, you're right to be feeling anxiety and depression, depression and stuff, even though you didn't have a quote, uh, crazy deployment. She was like, you, you're in the right. Like, don't feel like you, I almost had this, like, I don't deserve to be in a like bad mood or something. I was like, no, I didn't earn all that. Like I, it was very odd. Um, but it, the, the big thing though, I don't think I would get literally, to where I am now, I, I I know I wouldn't be if it wasn't for me finally reaching out to friends and actually letting them help me in some way. Uh, that was that's got to be the biggest thing because, like I said earlier, I kind of almost turned down everything military. I mean, I had all my stuff and any of the thing that I had them thrown away, I'd put in a chest, put in the closet, gone. Um. Once I kind of got back to embracing like my military friends and like 
the military humor that I enjoy, I kind of started feeling normal again. Um, and just in through connecting to friends, whether guys from deployment, guys that I've served with at a separate time, or just other guys that served, but we could connect on some level, that made the, a world of difference. Um, and that's why earlier when I was saying, like, I feel happy now, I have friends, I put an emphasis on friends because it's, it, it's almost strange for me now to say I have friends. Well, that makes and, sense. And I think connection is the key word, you know, and that's what yeah. a lot of us uh, who have to leave the military or choose to leave the military or, you know, you talk about transition, um, you lose a lot of those connections and those, those are tough. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think that's kind of a central thesis of, of what we can leave the, the listeners with is that that idea of connection is so super important. Um, and it's, it's yeah. really what helps you get through all the tough times. And, and that's why, you know, we focus when we talk about veteran suicide and everything else, it's, you know, those connections start to, whether they realize it or not, they, they're, slowly cutting those connections off one at a time and isolating themselves. And next thing you know, they're in a spot where they feel like they can't get out of it. So uh, I think it's a really super, super important message that, that you're leaving us with, man. And, you know, again, an unusual story. I hadn't, hadn't had a chance to talk to too many people who spent a lot of time in Syria, but I certainly appreciate the, the, the viewpoint and, uh, you know, look, the honesty and, and, and what you kind of peeled back the layers on, I think is, is great for our audience to hear. And, uh, I, I know somebody will hear it and, and it will it will change their lives. So feel confident in uh, the fact that your story is going to impact somebody in a certain way, Dale. So certainly thank you for telling it. Yeah, no, thank you. And just as like, I, I guys kind of get very like, oh, look at me, look at me. Um, I don't want that to come across as this was for me no. to be like a victory lap. Um, it's more, once I started listening to like your podcast and hearing other guys come out and talk about their things and so willingly to like a mass audience. Like for me, like for me, I've been nervous this whole time. Um, <laughs> but I, I just hope there's one, just one person who maybe was in my spot who goes, Oh my God, I'm feeling that. I understand that. And cause once you get that one time where you go, I get that, I feel that it almost like it's still alleviating where you kind of go, Oh my God. All right this is normal in a way and you know, I can do what he did kind of thing. So I hope, I hope this doesn't come across uh, for anybody listening. To it's me going, Oh, look at me. I, no, I mean, no, I know what I was. Not. Trust me. I, I was 12 Charlie. I happened to be in some random places at random times. It was fun. It was exciting, but uh, I, yeah, I know. I, yeah. No, it, 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 trust me, it doesn't come across like that at all. Uh, it, it's not – nobody here, as you said, it's a funny way, the way you phrase it, but I think it's appropriate. No, nobody did. A, nobody does a victory lap on this podcast. Nobody has and nobody would. Oh, yeah. uh, that, that's never been the intent of this, and uh, we just want people to tell their stories because, as you said, it's going to reach somebody. It's, it's going to connect with mm-hmm. somebody, and, and hopefully it will change their life uh, for the better the way your story has changed your life. So, again, mm-hmm. I appreciate you taking time to to tell us the story and – share with us some of you know the intimate things that you went through and it will absolutely impact so dale Ryder, thank you so much for being part of the hazard ground thank you man thank you so much you've been listening to the hazard ground podcast hosted by mark zeno if you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show send us an email at producer at hazardground.com and if you like the show Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.